lot of years ago, I, uh, I was in my first few years of pastoral ministry, and a young man that, that I had begun to get to know and was kind of shepherding uh, in our church family at that time, uh, got drawn into a Christian cult. Um, I, I, I tried to help him out, and as far as I'm aware, was unsuccessful at that. And uh, the, the organization at the time was called the Toronto Church of Christ. Sounds like it should be good enough, right? Um, part of the International Church of Christ. They changed the name recently to the International Christian Church or the Sold Out Disciples. But at the time, and, and, and I'm led to believe that ongoing, uh, they had a, a very heavy handed method of discipleship. Uh, very invasive, uh, kind of Bible instruction and, and discipleship practices. Um, if, if you uh, were going to become more like Jesus, you had to become more like your discipler. And so you, uh, your discipler checked in with you on a weekly basis. You know, what are you reading in scripture? What are you praying? Um, if you were married, they checked in on uh, the health of your sexual relationship. Uh, if you were uh, not married, they checked in on who are you dating and who, who are you seeing on Friday night or Saturday night? And, and are they a, an approved person? Are they an acceptable person for a follower of Jesus to be I heard of one situation where, so the, become like a discipler, one situation where the, uh, the lead pastor had a goatee and um, so all the men grew goatee because you wanted to be like your lead pastor. Some of you are really glad I don't have a goatee. Um, especially my wife, actually. <laughs> um, and ultimately you wanted to become like kind of the lead, like the head honcho, a guy named Kip McKean. And... Um, uh, there was a heavy sort of emphasis on accountability. Uh, it was controlling. It, it, it was manipulative. Uh, it centered on a person other than Jesus. Um, uh, it was false teaching. And we say, how, how, do, how do we identify false teaching as followers of Jesus? Uh, and, and if we suspect it, what do we do about it? Um, in my years of ministry in the Toronto area, there was another guy that I, I got to know quite well who, again, got drawn into a different cult, an organization called Oneness Pentecostalism. Uh, denies the, uh, the Trinity. Uh, says Jesus and Holy Spirit are not God, um, other than that kind of Pentecostal theology, but it leads to a number of really broken understandings of the scriptures. Um, he came to me because they were telling him that his baptism was invalid because he'd been baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that distressed him and he wanted, anyway, um, uh, another friend, I've had a lot of friends, hokey doodle, uh, lived kitty corner across the back fence who became convinced that the King James is the only legitimate translation of the Bible. Um, that other translations, other English translations are, um, are, are the devil's work and, uh, and ought not be read. King James only is what that thought process is called. False teaching. What, what do we do with this? How do we identify false teaching and what do we do with it as followers of Jesus when we encounter it? Now let me caveat that by saying we serve a very, very big God and my hope of fully comprehending him and fully understanding him in fact, I, I fully expect, I'm sorry to say it, I'll come to the end of my life and I'll face Jesus and I'll be like, oh, I got that part wrong, didn't I? Uh, because who, who can fully understand, fully comprehend one who is, is so great, so super intelligent, so everywhere, so all everything uh, and, and hope to get everything right? And they take enormous comfort in the reality that his grace is just as, as, as immense. His, his patience with me, with you, his long suffering. Uh, and, and yet we also have to acknowledge that uh, at some point error becomes a terminal error. It leads to eternal separation from God. Uh, the biblical word is damnation. So, so we realize that we're talking about something very, very significant. And, and so this morning, we're, we're going to look at the specific false teachings that the Apostle Paul has addressed Timothy 
concerning. He, he soundly renounces uh, these false teachings. Um, and in the scope of the letter, 1 Timothy, we're recognizing that, that there, there's eternal consequence in the conversation that we're having. So, so we're gonna approach it this way, kind of break down 1 Timothy chapter four in kind of three segments. Uh, what was the false teaching? First seven verses of 1 Timothy four. What was, what's Paul talking about here? Uh, secondly, uh, what is good, true, accurate teaching? Uh, kind of middle section of this chapter. Uh, in other words, what the, what's the alternative to false teaching? And, and then how do we safeguard accuracy? He speaks to that in the final segment of, of this verse. And kind of the big idea that I'm, I'm, I'm auguring toward, inviting you to kind of reflect on this morning is this. Uh, we live in a world where, where constant spiritual threat requires constant vigilance and care. Constant spiritual threat requires constant vigilance and care. And, and Paul's gonna challenge us that we must be careful, discerning, thoughtful, orthodox followers of Jesus. That's what he's longing for you and for me. So follow along as I read. I'm gonna start at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse one. I'm new, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. I'll be in and out of a couple of translations, mostly NLT and NIV. But here it is from verse one. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. But God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know that it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. We're going to read a few more of those chapters, verses in a few minutes. But let's start with this. What, what were they teaching? What is the false, false teaching that Paul is talking about here? And he, he pretty much spells it out for us in verse three. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. And Paul says these teachings were the teachings of demons working through corrupted humans and he calls them hypocrites and liars with seared consciences. So I mean, obviously, we're talking about pretty serious stuff here. But it's not the first time that Paul has called our attention to these false teachers. Back in chapter one, Verse four, he, he spoke of as, as false doctrines. And he described the things that were being taught as myths and endless genealogies which promote controversial speculations, okay? And he, and he won't actually be done with it here in chapter four either. By the time you get to chapter six of this letter, he says this, verse four. They, referring to the false teachers, are, conser are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. It's almost like the fruit of the devil there as opposed to the fruit of the spirit. Fruit of the devil, envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant frictions between people So, so it wasn't uncommon, that financial gain piece at the end of that, um, it wasn't uncommon in the first century for uh, people, secular or Christian, to uh, charge a fee, uh, receive a per diem of some description, a fee for service. Um, but what Paul's getting at here is he's actually getting at the, the, the idea that controversy sells. Uh, stir up a little dissension uh, speak in a harsh tone, and you will have a larger audience, uh, more subscribers to your YouTube channel. Some things don't seem to change. Provoke a little extra ire, and you'll do well for yourself. But if we go back to, to the, the 
false teaching that was, we, we began with back in, cha- in verse, uh, chapter 4, we would say, well, why would someone suggest that you should not marry or you should avoid marriage or, or let alone forbid marriage, which is what was being taught? I mean, after all, right, God created marriage. He said it was very good uh, back at the beginning of time. Jesus sanctioned marriage, showed up at the wedding feast in Cana, even blessed the families there when they ran out of wine with like the best, the best wine they'd ever tasted. Uh, so, so marriage is a good gift from God. Uh, gift, uh, food, good tasting food. It's a gift from God, uh, right from the very beginning. And yet remember there was a demonic voice then that was challenging those realities? Same voice seems to be showing up here, as far as Paul says, in Ephesus. Paul seems to be acknowledging an idea. This is having to do a bit of reading between the lines. Why would they say this? He seems to be acknowledging the beginnings of an idea that wouldn't kind of be fully recognizable until the second century. It was a, a teaching called Gnosticism. Uh, it was, uh, the Gnostics were beginning to infiltrate the church with, with sort of a secular philosophy or, or uh, way of thinking. They, they taught this, they taught that the material world is, is evil and the spiritual world is to be preferred. So if you wanna be truly spiritual, if you really wanna get to know God, well you need to deny physical pleasures like marital sex, like uh, good food, um, and, and then if you learn to see the special handshake and the secret password, you might get closer to God. Now, I'm, I'm kind of elaborating on the handshake and the password bit, but not much, not much. So, so this, teaching, this teaching cuts at the very heart of the nature of God. Is God good? Does he give us good things? And does he want to bless us or, like the Gnostics were teaching, does he, is he punitive? Is he, is he cagey? Does he stand at a distance saying, yeah, I'm going to test you to see if you're really sincere in your pursuit of me. Uh, I'm, go- I'm going to, um, I-, I might even torture you a bit, just, you know, just to refine you. That's, this is the kind of where the Gnostic ideas came from and went. And if we had any question about it, all we've got to do is look at Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate demonstration that God is a God who draws near. He draws near with compassion and with mercy and with a full revelation of his love. John 3, 16, God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Whoever should believe in him would not perish, have everlasting life. We've recited almost every Sunday, 1, John, or 1 Timothy 1, 5, the purpose of the instruction that Paul's bringing to Timothy is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. So this begins to maybe help us lean into what we'll call our, our first guideline. If you're taking notes, if you've downloaded the sermon notes, you can add it here. False teaching may, number one, call into question the nature of God. Did God really say? Is he really? Begins to call into question the nature of God. 1 Timothy 4, 3. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. So, so, so bless your meal. Pray. Give. We, we, we talk about it, it, it as giving thanks. It's not magic. It doesn't change anything other than maybe our heart and his presence with us as we enjoy the good things he's given to us. We're showing gratitude. Now, we're also pausing with our family, right? And, 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 and before we devour the spread that's before us, uh, not only are we aiding our digestion in our pause, <laughs> but we're also prompting one another 
to be mindful of the one who is our provider. We're reminding one another that maybe something like this, God is great and God is good. So therefore we're, we're gonna thank him for our food. But, but then, if that gives us a bit of an idea of, of the false teaching and, and what it is Paul's talking about, what is good, true, accurate teaching? Uh, we read in verse six, 1 Timothy four, if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Now, now we know that Timothy was first introduced to Jesus through the witness of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Uh, Paul actually gives us their names in 2 Timothy 1.5. But I wonder, what, what did they teach? What was it that they gave to him? I mean, Timothy's been with Paul for the past at least 13 plus years of ministering. He's heard Paul preach. He's actually written some of the things that Paul has recited to him uh, that we now know as scripture. Um, Paul's continuing to mentor Timothy through, through this letter. So, so what's a summary What's a summary of the things that have been taught that he would have received from his grandmother, from his mother, from Paul? Well, well Paul gives us that kind of summary, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, he says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, another name for Peter, and then to the 12. Down in verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Uh, what does Paul te teach? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of archangels, He's been building an assurance, an encouragement. These things are true. Early in the history of the church, they found it helpful to have some things to say that they could remember and, and recite to one another. One of the simplest was this. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Isn't that good? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So it brings us to our, our second guideline, false teaching. Number one, it may call into question the nature of God. Uh, secondly, false teachers may get very confused about Jesus. False teaching gets, typically gets one or more of the aspects of Jesus' work or his nature wrong. Any of these things could be true and it would qualify something to be declared false. Now Jesus knew that this was going to be a problem. He spoke about it. Matthew recorded it for us. Matthew 24 verse 11. Jesus said this. He said, many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be a rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. <clears throat> and it didn't take long for that to show up in the church. Almost every New Testament letter addresses some form of error uh, that, that Paul or Peter or John or James were, were, were trying to counter. So let me just give you a little survey of that. In his letter that he wrote to the church in Galatia, the region of Galatia, modern day Turkey, Syria, Paul was countering an insistence by some teachers who were coming saying, look, if you wanna follow the Jewish Messiah, you're gonna have to become Jewish. It was a false teaching. Paul counter, counters that. Uh, in the letters that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, uh, teachers had come among them saying, look, Jesus has already come a second time. You missed it. it. caused great distress among them. 
Paul corrects that. He calls it false teaching. 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, if you wanted to chase that down a little bit. To the church in Philippi, book Philippians, they were concerned because Paul was in jail and it felt like maybe, maybe they'd gotten it wrong. Maybe, maybe this was a sign of God's judgment on him. And Paul's able to write back to them and say, look, uh, you haven't got anything wrong. In fact, Jesus has been powerfully at work, not in spite of my chains, but because of my chains. He is actually in this with me. Just in the fall, we were looking through the letters that John wrote, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, from Ephesus, this city that Timothy is now in, receiving the letter. But from Ephesus, about almost 30 years later, John is there, writing to the churches in Asia Minor, and he writes this, 1st John 4, 3. If someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus... That person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. And in his second letter, chapter 1, verse 7, he says this, Many deceivers have gone into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So so false teaching uh, may call into question the nature of God. It may get very confused about Jesus. Paul here, 1 Timothy 4, 6, he writes this. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle. For our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. In other words, all people can be saved, but only those who believe are saved. Savior of all people, particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity until I get there. Focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Which this brings us then to our our final question this morning. How do we safeguard accuracy as followers of Jesus? And of course, we just read part of the answer there. Be an example to all believers. You, you. Be be an example to other believers in what you say, the way you live, your love, your faith, your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Let's read on. He's got more to say about this. Verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. So, so, so we hear that, right? Like, like how do we safeguard... Uh, the, the, the teaching that we received, how do we assure its accuracy, confirm its accuracy? Grow in godly character. That's just kind of a summary there. How do I do that? Well, I read scripture, I encourage, I teach. Grow, grow in godly character, the way you live. And, and then he says this. He says, use your spiritual gifts and work hard. Watch yourself, how you live, how you teach. Stay true to what is right. So, so we've got a third guideline or principle here to maybe add. False teaching may call into question the nature of God. It it may get very confused about Jesus, his work, his person. But it also has a tendency, it's just hinted at here, but it it adds to the work of Jesus. It adds to the work of Jesus. Paul speaks about this specifically in his letter to the church in Galatia. They they had teachers come among them who said, look, if you're going to follow the Jewish Messiah, you have got to become Jewish. It's what I've sometimes called the the Jesus plus way of salvation. Yes, Jesus is good, but you also need to. In that situation, men needed to be circumcised. Everyone needed to observe the Jewish food laws. Jesus plus. Uh, Here, people have taken what Paul said and they've made it Jesus plus work. Like Jesus plus good works. 
And that's not what Paul's saying here at all. He's not telling Timothy to work hard in order that he would be saved. He's, he's saying because you are saved, you need to work hard. Because you are a steward of like, the, the greatest news the world has ever known, you need to give yourself fully to uh, the sharing of that message, Timothy. But your salvation is utterly and only by God's grace. Now, another caveat is appropriate. He's not saying work so hard that you kill yourself. Like don't, he's not saying work yourself into the grave. He's not saying sacrifice your marriage or your family in all of this. He, he just finished writing about the benefit, the blessing of those good things, good marriages, good food. But he is calling us to a, a tenacious persistence in a godly direction. Stay the course. Now, we don't know what, for sure what the prophecy was that uh, was spoken over Timothy. Uh, it, it may have been that he was given the gift of teaching or the gift of leading, something like that, but we don't know. But we do know that Timothy was to be diligent and watchful. In other words, he, he, he was being called to be self-aware. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How do I lean into the work that God has uniquely done in me and through me? Because constant spiritual threat requires constant vigilance and care. You're doing that this morning. We've come to worship. But many of you make it a, a weekly practice in your calendar that I will worship. This is non-negotiable for me, not because it saves me, but because it's part of my personal vigilance and care to nurture my own spiritual well-being. Some of you will join in some scripture reading with us. So maybe, maybe you're doing your own scripture reading. That's fantastic. Go for it. Maybe you're reading with your life group. Or you're reading with a, a, a prayer partner or a ministry partner. Maybe it's your life partner. Fantastic. Continue it on. We, we do that not because these things save us. We do that because it's part of being vigilant. It's part of being watchful. It's part of being careful because we want to be successful. And, and so, so let me add a fourth false teaching guideline. False teachers, false teaching may call into question the nature of God. It may uh, get very confused about the work and person of Jesus. Uh, it may add to the work of Jesus, the Jesus plus way of salvation. Fourth one would be that it distracts from the mission of Jesus. Now Paul was speaking about this back in the first chapter of this letter. 1 Timothy 1.4. Paul called them controversial speculations. And he says specifically that, that they detract from advancing God's work. Controversial speculations. Uh, lots of voices would call us in a lot of different directions these days uh, about what's really going on in the world. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how, do, how do I know for sure? Uh, how do you know for sure? Uh, is Bill Gates and Jeff Soros behind some power grab that's part of the super rich strategy to whatever? I don't know. Uh, how, would we, how would you or I ever figure that out, right? Uh, uh, here's one thing I do know, that throughout history, there have always been people who are at work gathering power and influence and wealth uh, and, and often maneuvering at the expense of other people. I don't know if that's what's going on here. But this is not to be the focus of followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are not supposed to be about useless speculations, myths, or old wives' tales. Is Vladimir Putin part of that strategy and just launched a war in the Ukraine to distract from, you know, other things that were, unra I don't, un other things that were unraveling in uh, this supposed mastermind plan? I, I don't know. Um, I, I know I recognize evil when I see it. Anyone who's willing to kill someone else to achieve their end, um, you and I know evil. We know how to recognize these things. We know how to call them for what they are because we know uh, that it's not even about the person. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul tells us about that in Ephesians. So none of this, none of this whatever the truth behind it all is, none of this is supposed to surprise us. But the New Testament goes to great lengths to call us to our primary attention. That one supreme overriding truth. 
It's this. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. In all of this and through all of this, whatever this is, Jesus is reigning and ruling and he is calling us to give him our full attention. Because Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. So so we're doing some things as a church family in the middle of all this. Our our meals ministry has been busy uh, preparing meals for people who have been ill or or bereaved and just need help, need some encouragement. Our our youth ministry, three Friday nights ago, uh, spent the evening writing cards for some people that we thought maybe would appreciate some encouragement. Um, just as an act of grace. So it recorded about a 20-minute video of some music that the kids did. Uh, again, hoping that maybe it would be an encouragement. Our, our prayer ministry team uh, gathers every Tuesday morning from 9 until 10. We intercede for you. We pray for you. Uh, we, we almost always end up interceding for uh, those who are, in, are people of influence around our world. In Edmonton, in Ottawa, in Moscow, in Kiev. And then sometimes it's the simple things. I shoveled my neighbor's walk last week, and they shoveled mine this week. It was lovely. (laughs) And I hope and pray that the opportunity to share Jesus with each of them would be present. Uh, That the gospel would be evident in and through any one of us on a regular basis. basis. And maybe it's time to, maybe maybe this Lent season is a time to fast from YouTube. Uh, to fast from Facebook or uh, you know, uh, ma- the mainstream media, so second stream media, and, and just give ourselves a fresh to, to, give, put, to putting our attention on Jesus. I, I want to uh, invite the worship team to come and offer a suggestion of a prayer that maybe you would make your own um, today. Um, it would be something like this. Lord Jesus, what assignment would you give me today so that I may serve your purposes around me right now? Maybe you'd say that with me. I'll give it to you in segments. Lord Jesus, what assignment would you give me today? Lord Jesus, what assignment would you give me today so that I may serve your purposes around me right now? so that I may serve your purposes around me right now. Because Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. I wonder if you'd stand with me here, even at home. 325 AD, the church took that, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, and and expanded on it, agreed to some statements together. There are several creeds available. Uh, This is the Nicene Creed, and I want to invite us to speak this together. We're we're making a declaration about things that are true at, at, at the very heart. Christians for centuries, almost 2,000 years, have said and known these things to be true. Let's speak it out together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord's table is a wonderful place to come together and bring our confessions. You've just made a very positive confession. But let me pause and invite you to just quietly speak to Jesus before we observe the table together. What do you need to confess as sin? Maybe it's been distraction, maybe it's been, I don't know. And, and what do you need to leave here knowing that you have been forgiven? Let me just give you a, a moment to pause. Lord Jesus, you hear our confessions, our acknowledgements where we have misstepped, misspoken, misbehaved. Thank you that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just and forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord Jesus, you've heard the confession that we've made together in the Nicene Creed, that which we do believe. And Lord, in this table we come holding these truths, confessing them freely, desiring, confessing that we will be owned by nothing other than this.